so a while back I sent a few questions to the people over at Tarzir Studios who had so graciously granted me the opportunity to do an interview with them. Here, finally, are the questions and answers that I had presented and was given back, and some speculations based on the things that they said. Without further ado, let's get into it. So, with Little Nightmares having become such an international sensation, did you think that your game was going to be this big when you were working on it? Did you intend to make a game that is so ripe for theory and speculation? Yeah, we certainly hoped that there were others out there like us, who wanted to play a game like this, but we didn't set out to make a big game in that sense. We just really wanted to tell a story in this kind of world, and that's a dream that dates back almost 13 years when we made the City of Metronome prototype. With Little Nightmares, we knew we wanted to move away from this tell-them-everything mentality, where the player is basically a spectator. We wanted to leave them with something to think about when the game was over. All the theorizing and speculating has been great to read, because when you set out to tell an interpretive story, you kind of need people out there who are interested enough to interpret it. For those of you who don't know, City of Metronome was a prototype game that they started to put together quite a long time ago. Uh, here is a screenshot of some of the art from that game, which you can kind of see where there may have been a little bit of a an influence taken from this game into Little Nightmares. What inspired you to make a game like Little Nightmares, especially with it being such a departure from your other PSVR games, Static? Did you take some of the aesthetic choices from your experience on Little Big Planet? Well, quite simply, both Little Nightmares and Static were ideas that excited us, and the aesthetic for each was designed to bring those ideas to life in the best way possible, so we don't really see either of them as being a departure from the other. Static, by the way, is a sort of immersive puzzle game for the PlayStation Virtual Reality Unit that is the other game that Tarzir Studios has put out. What do you think are the biggest influences on the design, story, and style of the game? Well, that's an almost impossible question to answer, and can tend to give the wrong impression about where a game has come from. This game is the product of some of the most creative minds I've had the pleasure of working with, and although I could name-check some things that they and I enjoy, it doesn't tell anywhere near the whole story. Unless you set out to just mimic something that already exists, which to me is pointless, it's all about how those influences come out of you, and how they were transformed before they did. One of the best things about working here is wondering, where the hell did that come from? How much of the Little Nightmares world exists on paper? Even if we never get to see them, are there other locations that Tarzir has planned out in world building? What are they like? We're getting better at writing things down in general. If you want to work with others, you kind of have to. A big part of my job is to build worlds for all of our games, and establish a lore that makes sense, so that you know why you're doing what you're doing, not just doing it because it's cool. Man, this answer gives us so little out of how big the world of the Maw might actually be. He's expertly avoided answering this question, which I suppose that's fair. The game takes a lot of inspiration from Japanese myth and media. I see elements of many Ghibli movies in the design and story, not to mention in some of the concept art. Was the Ghibli-styled influence intentional? What are The Office's favorite Ghibli movies? I think we've covered the influence thing above. Our only intent was to tell this story as best we could. Many of us love and admire the Ghibli movies, and I've no doubt that that has seeped into our thoughts alongside millions of other things. I can't speak for anyone else, but my favorite is Grave of the Fireflies, although I can't bring myself to watch it too often. Yeah, no joke, Grave of the Fireflies is perhaps one of the most depressing experiences that I've ever taken part in in my entire life. I can't see how anyone would want to watch that movie more than once a year, maybe. This one is a pet peeve of mine, so I want to hear it from the mouth of God to set the record straight. Is the runaway kid's name Seven? Hello, my dearest peeved one. This is the mouth of God. I am sorry to disappoint you. When I asked for a little bit more clarification on this answer, he said, yeah, there's no way that I was going to actually answer that question, so I figured I'd just let the mouth of God have a little bit of the spotlight. So, 
While it is not confirmed that his name is Seven, it is also not confirmed that it isn't Seven, which I think is the trolliest bit of this set of answers. Though there are some other trolley answers in here as well, just wait till we get to them. What's the design process for the monsters like? How many versions did, for instance, the janitor go through before you settled on his final design? Well, that starts out with a discussion of the general idea behind the character, who they are, what they do, where they live, and then it's left with our concept artists, who produce sheets full of different concept sketches. They then discuss them with the creative director, who tells them which ones he likes, and then they continue iterating until we end up with the final concept. Not sure how many iterations the janitor went through until it was final, but I can tell you he has many alter egos, none of whom you would want to meet on a dark night. Man, if there are so many of these concept sketch sheets, what I wouldn't give to get my hands on some of those just to see what kind of things could have been in the game. Oh, it sounds so cool, I would love to see that. What is your stance on the recent data mine done on the game, which I rather think unfortunately revealed the 3D models for many of the characters in the game in detail? This is actually a topic that I've already covered in one of the other videos, but before I got to make that video, I had sent them these ones, so... I guess you can't really stop people doing things like that, but Little Nightmares was the game we released, nothing else. Maybe next time we should prepare for it, though, and hide some really deep secrets in there for the truly committed explorers. So this is probably the most important answer that we get in this interview. One, they did not intend for anyone to data mine the game. Two, anything that we didn't see in the game was not meant to be seen and was therefore not part of the canon of the game. And three, they absolutely didn't put anything in that we were supposed to find by data mining. So this puts all of that speculation and talk to rest. What can you tell me about Hunger? Will we ever get to see some of the level designs that were in there? Why the name change? Well, Hunger isn't a different game, it was just the working title for Little Nightmares, so there aren't any level designs to reveal in that sense. The name was referring to the themes we were wanting to explore in the game. Hunger is an evocative word in many different ways, and so it felt very strong to us as a working title. So strong, in fact, that we got more attached to it than expected. Still, as time wore on, the themes of the game had evolved to a point where hunger wasn't covering everything, so we had to start looking at alternatives. Plus, there's now the added issue of everything having to be search engineable, and typing in hunger game wasn't working for us, for obvious reasons. Here's another really important one that we have seen all over the internet already. A lot of talk is done about the relative size of Six to the other creatures in the Maw. I'm to understand that this difference in size was meant to be an indicator of helplessness, rather than an actual indication of biological size, but can you elaborate on the size of Six and the runaway kid versus the size of everything in the Maw? It's both, really. One thing feeds the other. It's about being a child who has to survive in a monstrous world that was built for others. In that world, you are biologically smaller and weaker, and the feelings of helplessness can't help but follow that. The interesting thing, though, is what comes next. How do you react to that power dynamic? Do you give up and be just another victim? Or do you look for ways to turn your perceived weakness into an advantage? This talks into why, for instance, Six can go through air vents and slip into little things where she's not supposed to, and why the runaway kid and the other kids like them all have the ability to ostensibly slip through tinier things where the janitor can't get to them. So it builds off of, like they said, it builds off of the idea that you're a child, you're small, therefore everything must be really huge to you. It is both ways. So Six is small, all of the children are small, because, and they said this specifically, this world was not built for them. What do you think of the people who publish their theories about the game? Do you have any requests or suggestions for topics that we theorists should look at more? Is there a possibility that you might take influence from some of the theories that the fans make as input for future installments? I think it's really cool that people have engaged with this world so much that we now have all these theories popping up everywhere. It's the kind of thing you can't prepare yourself for. 
this game and these stories we're telling, they're all really close to our hearts, so it just feels incredibly rewarding what's happening now. I don't think people need our help in coming up with new topics, though. For us, it's way more fun to see what people come up with next. As far as any kind of future installments go, we know how this world fits together already, so while we won't be pilfering from any of the excellent theories out there, it may happen that some of them cross paths naturally. Or perhaps they already have. So this is the bit where I stopped asking them questions about like the, the development of the game and the game itself and the processes, and I asked them a couple questions about the content of the game, and for these answers, I think you'll find that they've gone a lot more trolly to not spoil things for us. This is a popular question that I took from you guys. During the scene where Six bites the gnome and several others, there's a shadowy dark Six that stands watching her. Can you tell me anything about this shadowy figure? I could. Is there a family tree of creatures within the Maw? Popular but unfounded speculation seems to want Six and the runaway kid to be siblings, or the lady to be Six's mother. Without revealing too much, could any of those familial tie-type theories be true? It's natural to draw lines between things that live together. What a clever way to answer that without answering it even a little bit. Yes, it is natural to draw lines between those things, but is it true? Give us something. In my humble theorist brain, there's something different about Six, based on how the other kids in the comic react to her presence, and how the drawings in-game depict her in specific, but no other specific kids. Is Six more than just a normal, everyday kid? This one's probably really the most sinister one that we get back. There's no such thing as a normal, everyday kid. This question, and this answer, just open up so many possibilities, and I'm just so upset that none of us have really looked into this this bit of the details about the game any further than any of us have. Like, there's so much more that we have to be missing that we just haven't touched it, that we just haven't broken the surface on. Here is the question, and here is their trolley answer. How long has the Maw been showing up every year to pick up new passengers? A long time, but it has been the Maw for even longer. What does that mean? What does it mean that it's been the Maw for even longer? What could it have been before it went up to pick up the passengers? It says that this thing has been the Maw for longer than it has been picking up passengers. Which means that for as long as this thing has been picking up passengers, there is at least that much time before it started picking up passengers. How old is this place? What is it for? How can we find this information? Give me something to work with here. This is the last question that I asked them, and it's a really good answer that they gave us as well. And I feel like this is something that we can all apply to ourselves. Many people have made suppositions and posited theories on the content of the game. Have any of these wild speculations been accurate? And which theories are your favorites? I wouldn't like to say, to be honest, because all that does is quiet the discussion. I remember many years ago I made a Nietzschean reading of Mansfield Park for my English Lit exam. No idea where it came from, but the thrill was finding the evidence to support my theory, which I did, by the way. Bravo, bravo. It would have ruined the experience if I'd been given a definitive answer. They did that with the director's cut of Donnie Darko, and it became this thing that you then had to try to forget about. If you can back up what you're saying, you're doing a good job, and we won't be interfering with that. The fact that anyone is out there spending their time on this is immensely flattering. When we set out to make this game, and Static 2 for that matter, our ambition was to create a world that people would engage with, that didn't offer all of the answers, and asked you to think about that yourself. There are loads of cool ideas about who Six is, what the Maw is all about, and how all of these elements fit together, but for us, this is just the beginning. It's hard to theorize on beginnings. Oh my god, there's so much in this answer! So much that we can unpack and 
just gain information from. The first of which being, he doesn't want to tell us if any of the theories have been accurate, or which ones are his favorites, which implies that some of the things that have been said about the game, these wild speculations, must be true. It has to be that way. That he also talks about how revealing everything outright like they did with Donnie Darko makes it such that the thing isn't appealing anymore, and that the reason that it's interesting is because people like us, you and I, we continue to speculate on the game, and that's what makes the rest of the game so mysterious. So that's uh, another big thing, but the most important thing and this goes for the entire interview. This is the most important thing that he says in the interview. He says, this is just the beginning. It's hard to theorize on beginnings. Then how much are we gonna get later? How much more of this world are we planned to get? Is this Little Nightmares 2? Little Nightmares 3? Are we gonna get the television show having more information than we could possibly have gotten in the game? What can we expect from this world? There's so much that they have that we don't yet, and I for one cannot wait to be given more information about this world so that you and I can continue to speculate and theorize and just talk about it. I don't think there's anything more enjoyable about this game right now than the ability for you and I to sit down around the YouTubes and have these discussions. In the future, they've promised me an actual live interview, so it won't be just me reading their comments back to you. They are in the process of moving studios right now to a bigger and better office, which is exciting because it means that they've done well enough for themselves that they get to move to a new place. How hardcore is that? That's so cool. But after that's all quieted down, and maybe there's some more content out, maybe the second volume of the comic, maybe as far out as the second bit of the DLC, expect a live interview from Tarsier Studios. Oh man, it's gonna be so good. So with this, we're going to go ahead and close up this video. A super huge thanks to Dave Mervick, the gentleman who gave me all of these answers. A huge thanks to the people at Tarsier Studios for collaborating on the answers and giving me the opportunity to do this interview for you guys. Super appreciate it. And I really hope that you guys enjoyed the answers that I got out of it as much as I did writing the questions and getting them back. I'm sorry it's taken me so long to put this thing out, but there's been so many other things that were in the schedule before this one. So, anyway, yes, thank you guys very much for watching. I hope that you've enjoyed this. If you did, the like and subscribe buttons are waiting just below this video to have more questions than answers, and we'll just never be able to fix all of them. You can also follow my socials, that's the Facebook and Twitter that are in the description box if you want to stay updated on the things that I am doing. And if you feel like it, you can help support me making more videos like this one by donating a little bit to the Patreon link that's down there as well. It would help with making sure that I don't die of starvation. Thank you guys very much for watching, and I'll see you next time.